Hello What Culture Gaming, my name is Andy Murray from What Culture Wrestling and you might be sitting there thinking, who is this bald gimp and what the hell is he doing on our lovely little channel? Well it just so happens that I'm pretty much the only person in the What Culture office who watches the NBA and likes the 2K games, so here I am to give you my views on the latest incarnation NBA 2K20, just as I did for NBA 2K19 which I think is my only video on this channel. Once a year, baby. Anyway, we're gonna dive into things, but before we do, let me just assure you that my taste in basketball games is a lot better than my taste in basketball teams. Let's get to it. So as anyone knows who follows the NBA 2K franchise, or really, let's be honest, any gaming franchise in general, these games don't tend to offer a lot of revolution between versions. It's a matter of small tweaks, minor adjustments, a couple of new features here and there every single year, and of course, updated rosters, updated stats, all that good stuff. You know, that attracts a lot of criticism every now and then, but at the end of the day, it's a really effective formula, so why mess with it? That being said, there are a number of, you know, the usual array of nuts and bolts tightened this year. So I've just listed a few of them there, why not just read them off? Uh, we've got WNBA teams for the first time ever. Career mode has like a more of a fully formed storyline than ever before. Idris Elba off the telly is there and there's a collaboration with LeBron James. And of course we've got my GM, my league, my team, they're all back with all the usual minor alterations and improvements or maybe not improvements in the case of my team, but we'll get to that. And of course, we've got the usual array of gameplay alterations with 2K promising a more realistic experience than ever. And, well, yeah, of course, there's boatloads of microtransactions, but we're gonna get into all of that. First, however, let's not be bummers. Let's not be downers. Let's start with some positives. As far as the overall experience goes and first impressions, you know as a fan of the 2K franchise that booting it up for the first time every single year is kind of like greeting an old friend. It's like a warm hug for the first time in a year. It's comforting, it's relaxing, it puts your minds at ease. You know they're not gonna mess the whole thing up. You know there is a certain standard of quality that's gonna be met every single time. And yes, this does spur an innovation, but at the end of the day, you kind of don't need to reinvent the wheel when the wheel you've got is already pretty damn good. Poetry. In terms of a basketball experience, the bar is extremely high for this series. They have implemented a lot of different things into the game that have come in for criticism over the past few years, and they are present this year as well. But you know, the tweaks, the improvements they've made this time around I mean it isn't at all far-fetched to call this the most compelling, interesting, realistic, and fun simulation of basketball in gaming history, maybe. It's it's a really incredible experience when it's in full flow, but to do that, obviously, to appreciate it to its full extent, you really do have to cut out a lot of the bollocks. Like a lot of other players, including perhaps yourself, the very first thing I do when I load up a new edition of 2K is just jump right in, load up a game, hit play now, pick a couple of random teams, and start getting used to some of the tweaks. And one of the biggest alterations in this year's gameplay has got to be the use of sprinting. It makes slashing a very different experience. Whereas in the past, you could totally get away with just spamming the button, sprinting all the time, and just draining that stamina bar, knowing it was gonna pop right up again. That's not really the case this year. There have been some significant changes to how stamina works. It depletes quicker than ever. It's more of a resource. You have to manage it throughout your games. And I think this might frustrate a lot of people, but it leads to smarter gameplay. You really have to think about when you're gonna use that sprint. You can't just hold it in all game long. That's a cheap little tactic. You can't exploit that anymore. And really, it's more like real basketball. These guys, you know, they're tremendous athletes, but they're doing this six or seven, not six or seven times a week, but a lot. You can't sprint constantly from whistle to whistle to whistle to whistle. It doesn't work that way. And that's how this thing excels. The result of these tweaks is that driving is a more satisfying and realistic experience than ever before. You're gonna get a real buzz when you're finally able to blitz past a couple of players, hit the paint and slam it down. These tweaks won't please everybody. I think a few people will be sitting at home going, oh, I really like spamming the button, but for me, it really enhances the experience. And it feels like more of an individual experience as well in the way they've tailored the attributes, adjusted speed and stamina and all these things. In the past, you'd see kind of ridiculous situations where you'd be, I don't know, Russell Westbrook, you'd be driving, you'd be charging towards the basket, and suddenly you'd be caught by Bismack Biombo, which 
doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Fortunately, those days seem to be out. The new system is much more effective. It's much more like a real life game of basketball. Imagine seeing Bismarck Biombo catching a full flow Russell Westbrook. That doesn't happen anymore. It's good. There are, of course, all kinds of other gameplay improvements. Honestly, they'd really warrant their own video in themselves. I'm not going to bore you with every single one, but ball handling in general feels a lot tighter. There are specific dribbling styles that are going to take a lot of time for a lot of people to get used to, but when you do, you'll be killing it. Moving away from gameplay for a second, the aesthetics once again are just absolutely immaculate. This game looks and sounds great, it always has and it always will, so this is no great surprise. In terms of sounds, you've got an awesome soundtrack as ever with older artists like KRS-One, newer guys like IDK, there's all kinds of great stuff on that soundtrack and of course Kevin Harlan and Clark Kellogg, the best commentary duo in games. I mean, going from playing something like FIFA, where the commentary is so lifeless and really unreactive and mailed in and you just hear the same lines over and over again, to this, where it's like an organic thing, it's a conversation, they're reacting. It feels almost like you're watching a TV broadcast. It really is immaculate. The same goes for the whole broadcasting experience. It's really, really engrossing. It drags you in. It really gets you in the mood for a game of basketball. Everything from the studio stuff with Shaq and the boys to your teams coming out, to the PA system announcements, to the buzzers, everything is really, really tight. But that being said, there are a couple of hitches along the way, a couple of minor graphical inconsistencies. The most obvious one I can think of is that, well, some of the character models, while they are pretty excellent for the most part, and all the key guys, well, most of the key guys, look exactly like you'd expect them to. There are a couple of bum ones. Check out Nikola Jokic, for example. He looks like he spent his whole summer injecting some kind of substances and getting real buff. He's a lot more enhanced than he looks in real life. And that haircut is, hmm, yeah. I mean, far be it for me to criticize hair, but it's not right. But for the most part, the usual level of gloss and sheen is present and correct. It's just a really great looking game. And I think one of the biggest improvements this year is the facial technology they've used, the motion capture stuff. They've really, really made these players look extremely expressive. You capture everything from the agony of defeat to the thrill of victory. And that really helps you connect with the game as more than just a pure technical experience. Of course, in terms of gameplay modes, you are absolutely spoiled for choice. And let's start off by talking a little bit about my career. This year's incarnation is called When the Lights Are Brightest, and it is a collaboration with the LeBron James affiliated Spring Hill Entertainment, who, if you didn't know, are currently working on Space Jam 2. And it's a partnership for that, for the most part, really pays off. It's easily the most cinematic and professional my career experience that I can remember. It no longer feels small time or tacked on. Now, you don't get any goofy nonsense like frequency vibrations and his army of Bella and mates anymore. It's a more refined cast of characters. They've got more dimensions. They feel more real in a way. And I think this is something that a lot of people are going to really bask in because it almost feels more like, you know, even a movie. Like, it's quite common to call this a basketball RPG, and that's essentially what it was. But they're trying to tell you a story here. Of course, it eventually morphs into kind of the same old My Career mode we all know and we all enjoy. But the start, it's a really good idea. It's really ambitious, in fact. But does 2K's execution match their ambition with this story mode? Well, unfortunately, not all the time. It's a pretty familiar story. Your character, Che, he's trying to grind his way from college all the way up to pro. He overcomes a lot of adversity along the way. There's hurdles for him to jump. There's road bumps, people knocking him off course, getting back on track, all that familiar stuff. But unfortunately, despite the more cinematic feel and despite bringing Spring Hill in to kind of tighten a few nuts and bolts, the story really does at times struggle to generate drama and a lot of the beats are really quite on the nose. It's a real shame in a way because the overall theme of doing the right thing could have brought a really important message to the game and elevated it way beyond what it is. It's basically just a basketball campaign. And you know, LeBron's a guy who's never been shy of speaking his mind but unfortunately, I just kind of feel like he's been let down by his writers here. But having said all that, you're gonna get a lot out of this mode. It is still a very, very satisfying thing to play your way through. And as always, it's a really effective tutorial for the game mechanics. This year's version of the game also sees the introduction of MyGM 2.0. This is a different beast. It's more thought out, it's more tactical, it's more strategic because you can't just load the thing up anymore, put your team together and then just simulate to the end of the season. Now, you've got a number of daily tasks that you need to undertake in order to drive forward, in order to progress, and it's much more rewarding for it. 
Each of these daily tasks use up an action point and you only have a certain amount of them that you can use every single day. So you really need to use your head. You need to think about the areas of your team you want to improve, you want to progress. Now, as you level up, as you make your way through, more points do become available, but you know, it's just the more thought out. You can't just take it easy. You can't just be lazy anymore. You got to think about this stuff and really it's much more rewarding. Meanwhile, my league brings a number of new customization options to the table, but it's largely still pretty much the exact same thing. But if it ain't broke, why fix it? And if we're talking game modes, we really can't avoid talking, well, dedicating some real time actually to my team, because unfortunately, that's where a lot of 2K20's downsides come in. You know how, like, the popular phrase going around at the moment seems to be that this is a glorified gambling simulator rather than a basketball simulator. Unfortunately, a lot of that comes from my team, once again. Now, to be fair to 2K Games, I will give them their due here, but it's a relatively small due. They have taken a step to try and shorten the gap between those who are willing to pay to win and those who would rather do it the old school way by not getting the credit card out. They've done that by introducing these daily login prizes, and some of them, to be fair, are pretty good. They can really help you on your journey through this game mode. But, as a whole, it's still a pay to win mess for the most part. If you saw the trailer to this game mode that was released a few weeks ago that 2K have since put on unlisted on YouTube, very sneaky, but I saw what you did, then you'll know what I'm talking about here. There's a real gambling vibe. They kind of try and present the whole thing as a casino. There's bright neon lights, things are flashing all over the place. There's slot machines, there's roulettes. It's really kind of grotty in a way. And this is a game, let's not forget, that is partly marketed to children. And to top it all off, the ball drop feature, which was one of my team's saving graces because it's free, feels really slowed down and kind of unresponsive. So at the end of the day with my team, the reality of the situation is if you want to get ahead, if you want to win, you've got to pay or you've got to grind for ages. And of course, things like monetization, microtransactions, virtual currencies, these are topics that have been done to death and covered by people who are much more knowledgeable than me on the situation, people like your Scott Tailfords and your Josh Browns on this very channel. But it's a huge, huge part of this game. If I just ignored them, I wouldn't be doing my job. A common counter argument to all this is you have a choice and it's a voluntary transaction and yeah, I mean, that is certainly true to a certain degree. No one's putting a gun to your head and saying, pay all this money for these crappy virtual coins. But here's the thing, it's an intoxicating thing. It's a temptation, it's a predatory practice. And that temptation doesn't exist if these things aren't in the game. Whether they like it or not, whether they want to or not, some people are gonna waste their money and it really kind of sucks. As was the case with recent other 2K games, virtual currency is present in almost every game mode. And I think it really cheapens it. It makes it feel like some crappy lay mobile game. The only difference is you've paid 50 quid for the whole thing. And yeah, while sports gamers have been conditioned to accept a certain degree of monetization in games through this kind of grinding, hammering process, I think the backlash is well deserved. If we can move on from that negative and focus on another one for the second, I know, aren't I just a ray of sunshine? The day one experience, it, it's kind of all over the place. There's lots of people complaining on, online, lots of bug reports, lots of problems. People are talking about major gameplay flaws to things as simple as not being able to rename their my player. And that's kind of messy. During the review process, I encountered quite a few playing on PS4 myself. The most notable one was just trying to connect to the bloody servers. Now, I know it's a launch period and I know there's gonna be more people trying to connect now than probably at any other point in the game's lifespan, but bloody hell, surely these things have to be well equipped to handle the load. I mean, during one playthrough, I've literally spent a whole hour just hammering the button while I was typing up review notes, trying to get the bloody thing to connect. It would get to a certain extent and then it would say, we're sorry, we can't connect you right now. In the end, I just gave up. And at certain points during certain playthroughs, I couldn't access certain game modes and that's a real problem. Now, obviously this will be fixed with patches and things will calm down as the game's life progresses. But how, why should we be having this experience on day one? If you paid money for a game, it should work immediately. And I know this is another industry-wide problem, just like the microtransactions, but it's really not good enough. Get it together. So after all that, after running through my experience with NBA 2K20 with you guys, I'm actually finding it quite a hard game to rate because when you break it down, the core experience might be the best execution of the basketball side of the game ever. It's really tremendous. The minor tweaks really add to the gameplay. It feels tighter and more realistic than ever before. 
But while this game has left me exhilarated and really in the moment, really pumping some adrenaline, really getting in to the wonderful, wonderful gameplay, it has also left me frustrated at several points as well. And you know, that's nothing to do with the gameplay, that's all the other bollocks that I've just described. Obviously the bugs and other technical problems, there are things that are going to be fixed, so should they be factored into the overall first impression? Kind of wrestled with this quite a lot in my head, but came to the conclusion that yes, they should, because you know, when a game comes out, you want to be in the moment, you want to be in the zeitgeist, you want, zeitgeist, sorry, you want to experience it as it was intended to be played. You just can't do that at the moment. And as for the microtransactions, well, as always, they are a huge blight on an otherwise exceptional game. But the thing is, if you took out the day one experience and if you took out the monetization, I'd honestly be tempted to throw a five star rating at NBA 2K20 because at times, it really is that good. If you're one of the people who's lucky enough to be able to just kind of shut these things out of existence and ignore them completely, then you're gonna get a lot out of this and you will probably mark this thing higher than I'm about to. But at the end of the day, they're just kind of a blight on the overall experience from my point of view. You can either pay to win in certain game modes or you can grind. And honestly, the only kind of grinding I like is the clip song. So with that in mind, I'm gonna rate this game three stars. I would have loved to have been able to go higher and if it was rated solely on gameplay and things like my career, perhaps I would have. But that's the overall 2K20 experience. That is how it's rated. But anyway, as always, I wanna know what you guys think. So head on down to the comment section below. Did you enjoy 2K20? Do the microtransactions and the bugs get in your way? Or are you just totally in the moment enjoying another year of first class basketball action? Let us know down below. Once you've done that, you can like, share and subscribe, hit the bell for notifications and all that good stuff. And if you wanna keep tracks of all my bollocks, you can follow me on Twitter at Andy H. Murray. I'll have all kinds of hot takes and I'm well up for arguing about 2K20. See you later.